Hey everybody, Blue on Gold Z, thanks for tuning in. So the video that I'm doing right now is one that I've been wanting to do for about a year or so. There was a debate that I had gotten into with somebody on YouTube um, in regards to rifle ownership here in the United States. And basically, he was a person that felt that uh, private citizens such as ourselves um, should not be privy or, or have ownership um, to modern day uh, you know, semi-automatic rifles that are so popular uh, today in our culture. And before I wanted to do the video, I realized that even though a lot of the information that I was going to be providing was actually, you know, historical, <clears throat> uh, historically factual and current day factual, I realized that this kind of topic, you know, may, may or may not force me into a hypothetical situation that a lot of people that are on you know the gun grabbing side will basically say is is crazy talk you know basically on the conspiracy level so I wanted to create a brief epilogue before the main video uh, began to basically cite um, that I will be kind of crossing over that that line crossing over that boundary going into the hypothetical just just a little bit but a great majority of the video is going to be based on you know historical fact and current day fact um, you know, supported by the FBI, um, you know, crime report, so on and so forth. Um, there's a very good YouTube maker or YouTube video maker by the name of the Yankee Marshall, and his channel primarily focuses on, you know, firearms. And he did a video that was basically trying to serve the gun community as far as saying if you are going to be getting into a debate with an anti-Second Amendment, anti-gun person, these are the basic guidelines that you need to follow. And the primary guideline that he set up was that, you know, don't start talking about things like a revolution here in the United States, you know, civil unrest, government takeover, you know, conspiracy level things that, you know, even though there is a possibility that it may happen, it, it if anything, it may not be in my lifetime. Um, it may not even be in our kids' lifetimes. You know, it, it is potentially far off into the future, but still has a, a possibility of, of being avoided. Um, the thing is, is that, you know, sometimes it is kind of fun to entertain the conspiracy theories, um, at least little bits and pieces of them, as long as you don't get caught up in them. And this epilogue is just a really quick, um, you know, note to let people know that for me personally, the the whole civil war, government takeover, um, you know, shit hits the fan situation, outside of, you know, natural disasters like earthquakes and hurricanes, um, is basically the last thing on, on my mind. Uh, I just want to let people know that I'm just an everyday guy and that, for the most part, the main reason that I happen to defend, you know, the Second Amendment and why I'm such an avid, you know, defender of firearms and firearms rights is more along the, the lines of a day-to-day, -day, you know, issue. And for me personally, it kind of reverts back to an almost, you know, childish, it's, it's free, you know, I'm, I'm okay to admit that, but it's almost like a childish mentality of basically, you know, these are my, these are my tools, you know, leave them alone. I mean, it's like you're basically when you're like seven years old and you're, your parents gave you a toy. You don't want some kid to, you know, come and take your toy. I mean, it's basically yours. But, you know, putting that into adult perspective, you know, whereas a kid, we get stuff for free. I mean, the parent could take that toy back. When we're adults, for the most part, when we purchase firearms, we're doing it with our own, you know, hard-earned, you know, money. Um, we're, we're passing, you know, background checks because we've lived, you know, good law-abiding lives. And, that's the part that irritates me is that there's people out there and there's a government out there that wants to either, you know, take away what I've rightfully earned and purchased, uh, limit my ability to purchase um, those tools, uh, or, or they want to register them or, you know, confiscate them, whatever. All three or four of those reasons are the main reasons that I'm a, a defender of the Second Amendment and, and basically the right to own and bear arms. Um, as far as the whole conspiracy level things, I, I very rarely ever think about them. Um, like I said, more of my attention goes towards the day-to-day -day, um, reasons why I think it's important that we need to maintain our firearms ownership, especially in regards to long rifles. So um, later on in the video, it does kind of cross over into the hypothetical situation. I hope that you do find it you know, somewhat interesting, and I hope you can stick along um, and see the rest of the information. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. All right, guys, so this is the uh, first section of the main body of this video, and uh, this is the section that probably has, I guess you can call, like the meat and potatoes um, of the argument. Just as a, um, a reiteration, the purpose of this video is because I got into a debate with a YouTuber 
um, who basically was saying that there is no need for us to have semi-automatic, you know, modern-day rifles, and he even mentioned not even the reason or that we shouldn't have um, even semi-automatic handguns. So very quickly, I'll just tell you that, you know, I got into a debate with him on that, and he said, um, you know, he basically said that he was a Second Amendment supporter um, and that he owned, you know, um, you know firearms and, and whatnot. And, you know, I proceeded to inquire, you know, with him. And the first thing I asked him was, you know, what, what kind of firearms do you have? And he said, well, actually, I, I don't have multiple firearms. I only have one. And I asked him, you know, what kind of, what kind of gun do you have? <clears throat> and he said that he had, you know, some kind of revolver. And, um, you know, when he mentioned that on the comments, I couldn't help but, you know, roll my eyes and say, you know, you know, you, you know, revolvers are, are great, you know, they, they serve a purpose, they're going to be very relevant, but it's it's almost insulting for somebody that, that has a revolver to say, you know, you don't deserve a semi-automatic, you know, rifle, you don't deserve a semi-automatic pistol, you don't need it. Um, it's almost like a double slap in the face, because you probably couldn't talk to somebody that was more unqualified to tell me what I need in regards to firearms, if the only gun that you pretty much have is, is a revolver. So I thought it was was pretty hilarious, but um, I proceeded to basically tell him some of the reasons why his his assertions as to the reasons why we shouldn't have semi-automatic rifles was completely erroneous and downright idiotic, and um, those are the some of the information that I'm going to give here today. So basically, <clears throat> what what all of us pro Second Amendment supporters should fall back on is basically. Um, the FBI uh, Universal Crime Report or Uniform Crime Report, the UCR. And if you go on their website, um, and what I'll do is I'll actually put you know a link below to the exact website, so you guys don't have to you know go all over the website. Even though it is pretty interesting, I'm going to go to the exact page that shows you the gun deaths. I think starting from like 2005 to 2011. It breaks it down to the various kinds, whether it's handgun, shotgun, rifle, you know, um, all, all kinds of, of weapons and how many people, you know, unfortunately were killed by them. And But just for the purpose of the video, after I did my research, um, what I found was that in 2011, which I think is the latest information that may be available to us, it's 2014 right now, is that as far as rifles were concerned, in gun deaths in the entirety of the United States, rifles made up for only about 3.7% of gun deaths um, in the United States for 2011. An overwhelming amount of gun deaths caused um, in the United States was primarily by, as you guessed it, um, sidearms or pistols, where they constituted about 72 plus percent of, of the gun deaths in the United States. And I can pretty much guarantee you that a lot of those, you know, handgun deaths a great majority of them are not being done by, you know, law-abiding citizens such as myself or, or you. They're being done by a bunch of gangbangers in metropolitan areas, you know, drug cartels, um, you know, drug dealers. Uh, yeah, there is probably some malicious intent between private citizens, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, estranged, you know, ex or something like that. But a great majority of it is done by, you know, nefarious activities such as basically you know, gang gang warfare or gang fights and whatnot. So the overall point that rifles only take into account about 3.7% of gun deaths in the United States, um, at least in 2011, means that this gentleman's you know statement that that rifles are too dangerous and they're too they're too violent only means that he's he's drinking you know the liberal media Kool Aid, like by the gallon. Um, he, basically, the the over analyzation of the of the media's, you know, attention towards, um, you know, rifles. He's just, he's just drinking it all the way, and he's, you know, as far as a fishing reference, he's taking it, you know, hook, line, and sinker. So um, the other interesting fact was that um, over a 20-year period between 1992 and 2011, as far as the actual violent, you know, crime rate is concerned. There was a 50% reduction, according to the FBI, and the FBI is a agency that does not promote policy. Um, they don't have an agenda. What they do is they simply take their information either directly from their own investigations or from the various police departments that feed all this information, you know, to their network, and that's basically all there is to it. So obviously the data is not perfect, but it is literally the most unbiased, the most documented, and the most thorough data that we have. Um, so definitely it's something that is a help to us gun owners when people say, you know, you don't deserve a rifle because they're shown to be, 
you know, absolutely destructive, you know, mass weapons of destruction or weapons of mass destruction, which is completely erroneous. And when when you look at, you know, some of those facts, it kind of makes you wonder, like, why does the media focus so much attention on these rifles and to a certain extent on these shotguns? Why do they focus so much attention on long guns as opposed to the handguns? And also, why does the government itself, you know, whether it's Dianne Feinstein or Senator Leland Yi, um, Andrew Cuomo, uh, Barack, you know, Obama himself, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, why do they focus so much on the long guns? And basically, I have a theory in regards to that, and in the next section is where I start to cross over, and I hope you guys can bear with me. And, you know, I just have an idea as to why they're focusing so much on that, and uh, that will be in the next video, or excuse me, the next section coming up right now. All right, so in this section of the video, I just wanted to explain why being, you know, anti-rifle um, and or being anti, you know, long gun and saying that basically all we need is pistols or revolvers um, is very, very dangerous. And the first thing I wanted to do was I basically, I basically wanted to explain that, uh, you know, in in the past and in, in, not, in the not so distant past, there have actually been some occurrences where long guns were actually used by, you know, good, you know, law-abiding people to either defend themselves or to actually defend the Constitution and, and basically, you know, the proper laws of the land. Um, the, probably the most recent instance, major instance, um, that everybody will probably be relatively familiar with is probably um, the Los Angeles riots. Um, I remember I was pretty young at the time, I think it was maybe about 10 years old at the time, but I remember when, um, you know, everything started to basically hit the fan. I distinctly remember my dad, uh, you know, going into, you know, the closets and, and breaking out, you know, the shotguns, the 12-gauge shotguns. Um, these weren't combat-style weapons. They weren't pump-action shotguns. They were, you know, single and double-barrel, you know, hunting-style sporting shotguns, um, as well as his, uh, you know, uh, 1911 45 and uh, my 22, you know, long rifle rifle. That was the only rifle that we had um, at the time. I still remember him putting them on the living room table, and you know, I know how to use them, even though I was scared of the recoil at the time because I was, you know, small. But I distinctly remember my dad putting the long guns on the living room table because you know we lived in an area that was relatively close to, you know, what was affected mostly by, you know, the rioting. So that was a distinct memory for me. But what a lot of people don't know um, is that in 1946, I believe it was, there was an actual armed conflict where U.S. citizens in Tennessee, I think it was a city of Athens as well as the citizens of um, Etowah, Tennessee, um, actually rose up against um, the local government because of their, uh, you know, frauding of the polls, basically messing with, with the election results. And um, it was also known as the McMinn County War. And I'll put the link. Actually, there's a made-for-TV movie that was was produced, and it's actually on YouTube. And I will put the link uh, down below as well for you guys to, to check that out. But basically, the long and short of it was that there were some GIs that had come back from World War II. Um, when they came back to their hometowns in this county, they were very displeased with how the local government was running and they decided that they felt that they, you know, had overstayed their welcome and when election time was coming up, they put together a nonpartisan, you know, a non excuse me, a nonpartisan political party and basically ran against um, you know, the local assemblymen, I believe they were. There were two there were two people. There was a local sheriff and then there was a a, a senator, I believe or a congressman representing the area, and they were vying for seats to gain control um, <clears throat> either of the city, one of the cities, or the county, I'm not sure. Um, but basically what had happened was is that um, the, the local sheriffs who were in support of the corrupt government at the time actually confiscated the ballots after, you know, the polls were closed and took those ballots to a jail. And obviously what they were probably going to do is they were going to review the information and see, you know, basically who had won. And if they had lost, they were probably going to alter the ballots to make sure that the current political party that was in power or the current people that were in power maintained, you know, the power in their region. But obviously what they did was highly illegal. They, they took the ballots away. They took them into a jail. There was no, you know, public servants there other than the sheriffs. 
um, you know, they, they blocked off the jail, they cordoned it off, they locked it down, and they posted about 55 sheriffs around the area armed, you know, basically, you know, with the intent of defending against anybody that wanted to see what was going on inside the uh, jail. And what had happened was that the GIs, the, the people that were um, running the, the oppositional party, gathered, and I think they gathered some of their, their supporters, and one of the supporters had the keys to, um, I believe it was a National Guard armory, and these people already had their own weapons, they already had their own rifles and pistols, but obviously they needed more, because they had all these supporters that were with them, so they actually went to the National Guard armory, I believe, and opened it up, and uh, somebody had a truck, and they loaded the truck up with, with rifles, and, you know, took it to these, um, you know, the, the opposition supporters, they got their guns, they locked and loaded, and they went down to the jail, demanded access to the ballots, which they were promptly refused by the sheriffs, and an actual gunfight broke out. And to the point where it ended with the opposition party, or supporters of the opposition party, actually placing dynamite on the front door of the jail, and basically just blowing it open. Um, I've seen the, the movie itself. I can't remember if anybody was killed. I'm pretty sure there were some people that were injured. But when you think about it, I mean, this is actual, technically, this is rebellion. I mean, if in naval terms, it was a mutiny. And for something like that to happen in the United States, it's incredibly rare. And in the movie, you could see how the actors were portraying the concern that they were really about to cross the line, like they were really about to do this. They were technically going up against the government. And whenever you go up against the government, it's always a really, really tough fight. It might be your last fight. Um, and you can see how they had that look of concern, but they realized that this is something that they need to do because they're basically correcting something that's highly illegal and very morally wrong. And if they didn't have the, the, the long guns, if they didn't have the shotguns and the rifles, um, you know, this, this rebellion would not have been possible. Um, so there's a little bit of a spoiler alert. I will say that they were successful in getting the sheriffs to surrender. They actually did win the elections, and um, they actually did gain power, and all because they had access to, you know, long rifles, and as well as shotguns. So that, that is a pretty major thing that the government, the media, does not want you to know. I only found out about it about a year or two ago. I didn't even know that that, that had happened. And what, it just gives people the sense that, you know, it is possible. And also, mind you, um, none of the, um, the opposition, you know, political party, nor their supporters, nobody was cited. Nobody broke any laws. Nobody went to jail. Everybody was found innocent. The only people that were guilty were the sheriffs and um, the, the current government in time, which, mind you, was actually Democratic and not Republican. So that's a little small piece of information for you right now. But um, as far as going on in the world, you see long guns pre playing a, a prevalent part. I mean, you often get the argument that, you know, you can't, you can't, um, you know, go up against the government, you know, they have tanks and fighter jets and, and so on and so forth. But the thing is, if you're trying to control a population and you're trying to get them to do something or, or whatever, you're going to have to go down into the ground. You're going to have to fight block to block, street to street, field to field, house to house, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, we're just going to get predator droned and, you know, that we're going to get hit by, you know, fighter bombers and stuff like that. There's no way that we can be able to 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 amount to, to anything. And the thing is, is like, you know, tell that to the people that were, you know, uprising against their government in, in Libya and Egypt and Syria and in certain in certain regards, Iraq. Um, regardless of their political or, or religious ideology, the fact remains that when you get a large amount of people that are pretty well armed, even if they are facing technically superior forces, um, the fact remains you still have to get down on the ground and, and you pretty much eradicate any kind of advantage that, that that superior force may have in regards to technology and hardware when you're fighting people that are only maybe 20, 30 to 100 yards away. So that is something that also lends itself as to why we need to maintain our, you know, long guns, just in case something like that may happen, even though, again, like I said, I'm on crossing over, this is a little bit of the crazy talk, but it is something interesting to at least, you know, think of, um, you know, as far as exercising the mind and on consequences, your actions and, and consequences. Um, so, yeah, basically things like that have happened in the past on U.S. soil, like I said, the L.A. riots, 
um, again in 1946, or you know, prior to the LA riots in 1946, there was the McMinn County War, also known as the Battle of Athens, which I just described. Um, so that has actually happened. Um, the current struggles that you see happening primarily in the Middle East. Um, whoever typically has the guns are the ones that are in power. And um, the next section of this video is why I get into some of the technical reasons as to why um, it's important to maintain, you know, long gun ownership as opposed to just pistols. Okay, so now that we've discussed and went over that in the not so distant past, even on U.S. soil, there has actually been a usage for private citizens to use their long guns, um, you know, again, in 1946, as well as the Los Angeles riots, which I was, you know, there firsthand to actually witness. Um, I wanted to go now into, I guess you could say, the more technical, like, tactical reasons as to why saying that we don't need rifles um, or long guns in general, and that we only need to resort to pistols or, heaven forbid, revolvers is just, you know, outright stupid and, and, and pretty, pretty dangerous, um, e even in regards to a, a home defense or a property defense situation. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about pistols. Uh, this is my Springfield Armory um, XD. It's been safety checked. Uh, no bullets in the mag. And chamber is empty. So pretty much the biggest disadvantage in regards to just having a pistol uh, as opposed to a long gun, like let's say you're the person that has a long gun and you're going up against intruders or, or what have you that have, um, you know, rifles. So you have a pistol, they have a rifle, I'm not sure if I said that correctly, um, is pretty much just the, the biggest advantage is the, 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 in, the in, inherent or innate inaccuracy that using a pistol brings, um, as opposed to a long gun where you can basically shoulder the weapon and then have a cheek weld. So now there's two pieces of your body that are holding the gun in, plus, you know, you're using your, your hand and your forearm to hold the, the rifle. When you have those multiple points of contact, um, it really, really increases the effectiveness of that weapon um, in, in regards to accuracy. Um, in regards to a pistol, you don't get really any of that. I mean, they do make some kits for Glocks where you can attach something here and, and put it onto your shoulder. But when it comes to a pistol, I'm going to point the, this empty pistol at the camera. When, when you are pointing the pistol at, at something, um, you know, especially if you're scared or you're under attack, you know, bullets are flying at you, you've got adrenaline going through you, and even just from the actual, you know, motion of the pistol as it operates, your your muzzle here, obviously there, it, it's going to be all over the place, even before you fire. And it may not seem like that big of a difference to you, but in actuality, the, uh, just, just a few millimeters here of being off-center of your target could literally translate into, you know, inches off the target, you know, basically you missing. And, and additionally, the further and further away that a target, you know, uh, gets from you when you're using a pistol, the more inaccurate that you're going to get. And additionally, a lot of people or some people don't consider that the further away a target gets when you're using a pistol, the pistol rounds also start to lose steam and also become less and less effective. So um, here, I'll bring, I'll bring out, this is kind of heavy, sorry. This is, uh, this gun has also been safety checked. Uh, yep. Yeah, so it's empty. Um, this is my uh, 6 hour 7.16 AR-10, um, and basically as opposed to the, the pistol which can, you know, move around, even when you're not under stressful conditions, I mean, if you're just, if you're just going to the range and, and shooting, um, in, you know, and you're calm and everything, you know, yeah, you could probably be a pretty decent shot, but you're going to be missing some shots. And again, imagine if you're under a stressful condition, people are shooting at you, you're scared, and you've got adrenaline through you. The the pistols, for the most part, are a last ditch weapon, only to be used if your if your long gun you know goes down for whatever reason. But I just wanted to give a graphic display as to the advantages of of a long rifle or a long gun over the disadvantages of a pistol, just by simply you know shouldering the weapon. I mean, as you can see, you know if I've got if I've got like a good 
you know, cheek weld. It's up against my shoulder. I'm drawing it into my shoulder. I have a good, you know, grip on on the uh, the forearm. Um, that that will make for an inherently more accurate and more effective weapon. Additionally, one of the benefits that that rifles have over pistols is their ability to accept. Uh, you know, larger bullets um, that can reach out and touch people even further and create more damage as opposed to pistols, which we'll get to shortly in, a, in another uh, quick subsection that I'm going to do right after this. But the last thing I wanted to mention before we switch over to, like, the ammunition um, technicalities is that one of the other advantages of having a, a rifle or a shotgun over a pistol is in regards to what I call, like, the real estate, um, how much real estate is on a gun. Um, as you can see here, you have limited real estate on a pistol. You can't, for the most part, you really can't put magnifying optics on the pistol. They're, they're, they run best whenever they have just no obstructions from the top, so the shells can, the empty shells can just fly out. Um, you can pretty much just put a laser light combo like I have on mine. This is a Streamlight uh, TLR2, and that's pretty much where your limitations or your, your equipment um, abilities end is basically with a laser light combo that can go underneath the gun using like a Picatinny rail. Um, as opposed to a rifle, you have much more real estate, especially when you start using quad rails um, to put different kinds of um, you know equipment that can really help in different regards. And already on this rifle, on my AR-10, I already have a piece of equipment on there that just gives an, an even bigger advantage over somebody that might just be armed with a pistol, is this uh, 16 power scope. Um, you know, theoretically, I think in some states, civilians might be able to, but definitely the military can, as you can even put grenade launchers under here. I mean, you're not going to be able to put a grenade launcher underneath a pistol, and if you do, I mean, that's a pretty crazy idea. But, um, for, but yeah, there's just so much area that you can put different kinds of equipment, you know, laser range finders, night vision, <clears throat> um, you know, scopes, grenade launchers, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. I mean, you could even you know, whatever, you could put a lot of stuff on there. So that not only gives a range advantage and a hitting power advantage and a stability advantage and an accuracy advantage, but also an equipment advantage that can really, really put whoever is just using a pistol, um, you know, in, in a very, very tough situation. So now let's get into the munition side as to the reason why um, it's dangerous to say, we don't need this anymore, we can just settle with this. Okay, so I just wanted to put up a, a quick um, reference display as to the reason why um, rifles will have basically an inherent advantage over pistols and what that could mean for, you know, for somebody in a real world situation um, is basically having to do with the physical size of the various cartridges. Um, as you can see, the two cartridges that you see here, um, I guess the left, if you're, you're viewing the video, um, are rifle cartridges. The first one is an AR-10 uh, cartridge. It's a 308, um, 7 by 6.2 or 7.62 by 51 for metric measurements. And then this one is the, uh, the famous good old American 556 um, 223 caliber, uh, which is fired by the AR-15. So AR-10, AR-15. And as you can see, they are a lot taller than the pistol cartridges that we, the three pistol cartridges that we have here. The first one is the 45 ACP. The next one is the 40 Smith and Wesson. And then last but not least is the 9mm Luger or Parabellum. And basically what this means as far as, as a conflict is concerned is that the, obviously rifles, the magazines are, are designed to accept longer, taller rounds. And whenever you have longer or taller rounds, you afford the ability to put more uh, propellant inside, you know, the casing here as opposed to the pistol rounds. And again, that ties back into the range advantage that rifles have, you know, over pistols. And additionally, not just in, uh, not just as far as range is concerned, but there are also ballistic advantages to having more powder even though even though the diameter of the pistol ammunition is actually larger than the rifle ammunition the fact that they have so much kinetic en energy because of all the propellant that they have um, makes them more deadlier or more deadly overall than than pistol ammunition and once you start to get beyond a certain range for pistol ammunition 
these these pistol uh, rounds will actually lose speed, especially the 45. Uh, the 40 typically has the most uh, um, energy, but you start getting to you know 50, 60, 70 yards, and you get hit by one of the pistol rounds, you're more likely to not only survive, obviously depending on where you get hit, but you're, you're not only more likely to survive, but you're going to be more likely to actually still be combat effective and return fire and, and still basically be a threat. Um, rifle ammunition kind of solves that problem. If you're getting hit by one of these rounds, I believe the 5.56 is effective uh, or or has its most effective um, range within 0 to 400 yards if I'm not mistaken and the 308 I think from 0 to I think it was 6 to 800 yards so obviously you can reach out and touch somebody a lot easier with this and again because rifles afford the ability for you to brace your you know the, the gun up against your your shoulder your cheek and your forearm and then you combine that with the added ballistic power of of these cartridges and the range. I mean, it it makes these these pistol ammunition, um, these pistol calibers, really pale in comparison when it comes to like, you know, further distances. So this is again another reason why it's very very dangerous um, to say that we don't need you know rifles anymore. Um, we're we're only fine with pistols. I mean, this is this is a clear physical indication right here. And again, you know, going back into the FBI, uh, you know, crime report, uh, ammunition such as this, as well as like AK. I don't have any AK rounds. They're almost never used. Um, and I also wish to say that the 3.7 percent was for rifles in general, not ARs and AKs. ARs, AKs, and other rifles are subsets. Of the rifle genre, so that means that of that 3.7 percent, ARs and AKs actually make for less of a usage of the gun deaths. So I don't know what that would be. There, there hasn't been a study that focuses on on you know the specific type of, of weapon used, but I would wager to say that ARs might make up I don't know 2.5 percent, 2.7, 2.8 percent. So it's even less. So when somebody says that we don't need ARs and AKs, not only is it completely unwarranted, but should a situation happen, and it has happened, and I will get into that later, and I'm not just talking about the LA riots, but should a situation happen where there is some kind of unrest or, you know, even natural disaster and something happens where you need to defend yourself and you need to keep your family safe, you would be much more confident in having a gun that can shoot calibers like this as opposed to calibers like this. All right, everybody, so this is basically the conclusion of my video. Um, I hope you enjoyed some of the content that I've been able to provide so far. Um, I know that I promised that I was going to mention, you know, basically my theory or ideas in, in previous sections of the video, but I just got caught up. But what better place to have the 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 my my end game theories or whatever you want to call them than than towards the end um, or last section of this video? And this is basically what what my uh, my theory is, and how I describe it is as far as long guns are concerned you know, shotguns, but primarily rifles, because we all know that rifles get the, the most media attention and most government attention. I view <clears throat> the Second Amendment, like, let's say the Second Amendment is kind of like a castle. You got the inside, which is pretty much um, the city where maybe civilians live and, you know, um, you know, other servants and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then basically you have, you know, the main the main wall you have you know the moat and and the gate and the wall also has you know the, the parapets and the turrets and areas where you know defenders can stave off an attack for as long as possible as far as the second amendment is concerned um, as far as the firearms are concerned long guns such as shotguns and rifles are the moat and especially the wall of that castle they are basically the the first line of of defense in, in regards to a legal situation and how bills are passed um, you know in in our form of government and basically what that means is if if the federal government 
um, or maybe even on a state level, like what's going on in like Connecticut and Massachusetts forever, or for instance, if if long guns can be banned, restricted, confiscated, any of those things, with with the knowledge and fact that they account for, for so little of, of actual gun deaths and gun crime, if they were actually to fall, imagine, you know, the castle walls, like, falling, everything else inside of it, of that castle, is now free game. It's completely open to attack. And you might be wondering, okay, well, what is what is left over? It's going to be pistols. And it's going to be so easy for our politicians to basically say, you know, I, I mean, imagine a situation where now long guns have been, let's say, at a federal level, a country, a, a nationwide level. Let's say, you know, long guns have been confiscated, like they have been in um, Australia and, and in the UK. All long guns are pretty much gone, um, maybe except for, like, single or double barrel hunting shotguns, you know, AR-15s, AAKs, SKSs, whatever, they're, they're all gone, they've been confiscated, you know, it's now the law of the land. When, if, if lawmakers were able to get over that hoop and basically sweep long guns, like, under the rug, what makes you think that it won't take, I don't know, a matter of weeks to months for them to say, oh my god, look at the real killers out there, look at the, the, the handguns that are out there, they caused... 72 plus percent of all the gun deaths in the United States. That's an overwhelming amount of, of, of you know, you know, deaths. We need to we need to go after those next because those are even more of a threat than than rifles and shotguns. And that's basically what's going to happen. The government would start mandating that you know all pistols, you know, semi-automatic pistols, maybe even you know revolvers, also get confiscated. And what that will lead to is a complete disarmament or meaningful disarmament of of the entire country. And when I say meaningful disarmament, I mean probably the only things that, I mean, if the government is nice to us and if they permit it, you know, they might let us use single barrel shotguns, double barrel hunting shotguns, you know, the kind where you shoot twice and then you gotta break it open, take the shells out, put two new shells in. You know, they might let us keep revolvers, but, but that's the thing is that if rifles fall and shotguns fall, everything else is just going to tumble down with it, and we are going to be a completely, you know, disarmed nation. And if you think that the government can pretty much get away with anything they want to virtually, you know, nowadays, uh, imagine what they could possibly get away with when we are completely, you know, clawless, we're completely toothless, like we're complete, we're just sheep. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. So I get really irritated when you get some people out there. This all falls back to that one guy that I had a debate with where he was saying that he was a Second Amendment supporter and, and yada, 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 but he says that, you know, I believe that it needs to stop at basically revolvers, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, so people like that got to be really careful what they wish for because they end up walking away from from you know either youtube debates or personal debates you know in real life thinking that they're helping the gun community when in fact you are only being very damaging towards it and you are actually really hurting yourself and in the long run you could be hurting your kids or your kids kids because you know every time there's a new generation there was a political um there was a congressman or somebody said something that every single generation basically needs to know what they need to do in order to maintain their freedom. It, we don't, we, it is not by default. It is not just keep on running over and over and over like a loop. I mean, if one generation falters, then the next generation will fall even more. And that's basically how everything begins. So that overall, um, you know, is, is my overall concern as to why people essentially need to shut the hell up when it comes to you know, telling me and other people that I don't need my AR-15, I don't need my AR-10, I don't need my AK, I mean, I don't have an AK, but um, they really, really need to educate themselves and, and, and figure out that what they're doing is they're barking up the wrong tree. And we really need to look at other problems other than the guns themselves. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, hopefully you, you were able to watch the whole video. Um, please like and subscribe if you like the comments, or excuse me, the content. And I do have some more videos, gear reviews, and, and other things coming up. Thanks so much. Blue on Gold Z signing out. Harley.
Did you have any input on the video? Huh, Harley? Did you want to be in the video, Harley? <laughs>